we started a series called The Unholy Trinity this past Sunday. And I explained to you what the unholy trinity is. Today is part two. I may make some references to what we did last week, but not the whole thing. So I would want you all to, if you really want to track with this, you, you need to listen to the last Sunday's message on YouTube. If you can look at it, you will be able to uh, track what we are doing. And at the back of your bulletins, we have notes. We have notes for this Sunday, so you can start taking notes as I go through this. The Holy Trinity is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, as I said. And they work together in communion, in unity in this world. And this is a very integral and significant doctrine of our Christian faith. Many of us get confused or we say it's beyond our ability to understand. Yes, it is true. Just because we cannot understand how these things work, it doesn't mean it does not exist. So this beautiful doctrine of Trinity in which Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are in communion with each other is amazing because now we have the Holy Spirit who is at work in this world. The Father and the Son are there, and we are waiting the coming of our Savior Jesus. The unholy trinity, on the flip side, are these three pieces. One is Satan. Number two is the world system of thought. And number three is our sinful nature. They are like the three-stranded cord. Three-stranded cord. They are tied with each other. They are independent and they work together in tandem to destroy our lives. And this past Sunday, I spoke about Satan. I zeroed in on who this Satan, this ancient serpent is and how he is still at work. I showed you some of his mechanisms, his strategies that he uses. I showed, it, I showed that to you. So... And I gave you some descriptions of what the Satan is this past Sunday. And continuing on that same vein, what are some of the other descriptions of the Satan or the devil? And today we are going to zoom in on the world system of thought. The world system of thought. So the descriptions of the Satan or the devil is this. Why do I now come come and say, there's a world system of thought that is at work in each and every one of our lives. It's because of this. In John chapter 12, verse 31, John chapter 14, verse 30, John chapter 16, verse 11, Jesus himself is speaking. And you know what he's referring to? He tells so clearly, this is what he says. He says, the prince of this world is coming. The prince of this world is coming, and he has no hold on me. He said he has no hold on me. And this he says right after an encounter in the heavenlies, meaning he has just predicted his death, and his soul is troubled. And Jesus responds to say, Father, shall I say, save me from this hour? And then he goes on to say, no, but for this, for this very hour did I come, and for this very reason I came to this earth. Father, glory for your name. And then after that happened, Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. Jesus refers to the devil as the prince of of this world. He is the prince of this world. In John 14, 30, again he says the same thing. He has come, he has no hold over me. In John 16, verse 11, he says, when he's talking about the Holy Spirit, that when he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So you see how Jesus is 
being, uh, Jesus is referring to the Satan as the prince of this world. This is a description. Another description of Satan is the ruler of the kingdom of the air. In Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 2, it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work, at those who are disobedient. There is a spirit which is at work at those who are disobedient. So people, you are not disobedient because you like to be disobedient. Of course there are some people like that. But then, not all are like that. But there is a spirit who is at work who is making people to be disobedient and Paul refers to him as the ruler of the kingdom of the air. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, this is how Paul writes. He talks about that. He says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. For we do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves. And even if our gospel is veiled, meaning if it's covered, he is saying that it is veiled to those who are perishing. And this is the description he gives. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of of God. So what does this God of this age do? He blinds the eyes of the unbelievers so that they will not be able to see the true gospel of Christ. The display of Christ's glory, it says. The glory of Christ who is the image of God. This is a very clear doctrine in the scripture. The Satan, who is a real being, a spiritual being, who existed even before, but he was created by God, who fell down, as I said last week, who was thrown down from the heavenlies into the earth, along with him dragging many angels, he is called the prince of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, he is called the God of this age. So how does this and the world system of thought connect? How does this fact that here is a Satan and how does the world system of thought connect? Because he is there in the world, he is ruling, he is a prince, he is a God of this age. This is the definition I have for you. It is a way of thinking that is directly influenced by the evil one. What is the world system of thought? It is as simple as, it is a way of thinking that is directly influenced by the evil one. There is a way of thinking in this world which the enemy of our soul influences and that is what is out there. He influences each and everybody. And today we are going to see how he influences too. What are the sources he is going to use? But this is a major phenomenon that is at work. He has formulated a system of thought in this world that this is how the world is supposed to be. He has influenced that thought process. How do I say that? In 1 John, 1 John, Chapter 5, verse 19, is, this is what it says. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So, who is controlling this world? John writes, the whole world, I've got news for you, is under the control of the evil one. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, that is where you see the temptations 
that Jesus is encountering. At that time, you know what the, what the enemy, Satan, does? He takes Jesus and he shows, look at this whole world. Look at the splendor. Remember he says that? Who is he talking to? He's talking to the creator of the universe. And he is telling him, look at this. Look at the splendor out there. It's all mine. I can give it to you. It's under his control. I can give it to you. That's what he says. And in Revelation chapter 12, again, the writer, when he's writing about that, he's saying, the one, the deceiver, who leads the whole world astray. Who is leading the whole world astray? He is the deceiver, the one who was thrown down. So, why do I say that? If the whole world is under the control of the evil one, what's the point? We are saying God's sovereign, he's all powerful, and here it says, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Here's the devil who's leading the whole world astray. He's called the God of this age. He's called the prince of this world. He's called the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And we all say God is sovereign. Right here there's a conflict. How can God, came, how can God claim to be sovereign and here it is says that the whole world is under the control of the evil one? You know, God lives in the eternal now. Meaning, he created this world for eternity. And this world that we are living, this time that we are living in, is a limited amount of time. It's passing. We are just passing through. God is sovereign. He is in control. How do I say that? How do we now bring these two thoughts together and still know that God is sovereign? We are living not on home ground, not on home territory. We are living on enemy territory. You and I are living in enemy territory. So when we are living in the enemy territory, it's like when they have games, home games and then you have the away games, right? So when these basketball players go and play in the away games, they are actually playing in the Opposing on the enemy territory. So there will be some people there who will be booing them whenever they throw in a basket. They say, oh no, our team is losing. But still there are teams that win away games. They defeat the home team. Happily they trash them. You and I are supposed to do that. Though we are living in enemy territory, we are supposed to beat the enemy down and be overcomers. And why? And how we can do that? We'll come to that. I want to tell you a fun story. You know, I like scripture and I like some fun stories. Last week I finished with one. And here's a fun story here in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 11 through 17. And God still reigns. In spite of the fact that I told you that the whole world is being uh, led astray by the evil one. He is ruling. He's called the king, prince of this world, etc., etc. God still reigns. He still rules. He is on the throne. He said, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. He is still ruling over all these chaos. So this is happening way back. In uh, 4,000, 3,000 years ago, the king of Aram, which is present-day central Syria, he is in conflict. He's having a fight with the king of Israel. He wants to attack Israel. So Syria can say there's a war going on. Okay, they, he wants to go and attack Israel. So what he is doing is he is planning. He said, "Okay, guys, this is what we need to do right now. All right, we got to go. You got to go to this particular place and then go be in hiding and then you got to attack the Israelites." So he's making a plan. And then they, they decide to go, and before that, you see the Israelite army right there. And he's scared. He's wondering, what's happening? Who is the one who's going and spreading this information? Somebody here, accomplice. Somebody inside job. Somebody here is going and telling the Israel king what's happening, the things that we are planning. So he calls everybody in and he says, who is it? 
I need to know who is going and giving this information of how we are strategizing to attack Israel. Who is passing on this information? And you know, one of the guys said, Sir, none of us do this. None of us do this. But you know, there is a man of God out there in Israel who hears what you speak in the bedroom and he goes and tells the people. So remember, whatever you speak in the bedroom is being heard. You can't think that, oh, I'm speaking in secret, nobody knows about it. No. What you speak in the bedroom, wherever you speak, even in the restroom, if you speak, that's being heard. So whatever was spoken in the bedroom, in secret, was being revealed to the man of God. And Elisha was the man, and he was telling the guys, this is what you need to do, go and stand there. And then he's all set. So what happens is, one day, they, but then they make additional plan and then say, okay, the king of Israel, uh, Syria, Aram, he says, okay, now the target is that guy, Elisha, the man of God. We need to go and get that guy. Forget about this there. We need to get the man of God. Enemy targets those people who follow Christ. He will not target anybody else. If you are a true follower of Christ, you will have the enemy following you very closely. If, you, if the enemy is not following you, that means you're not truly following Christ. Because he knows who is following Christ. So now the enemy here, the present day central Syria, the king, he sends an army, horses and chariots. Everybody is gone there. And then they go and the servant of Elisha comes up one early morning and then he brushes off, he comes and he wants to come to the balcony and take in some fresh air. And he looks. He sees his horses and chariots all over. He's scared. He said, oh man of God, look at this. Come and see what's happened. What's happening? Look at all the horses and the chariots that are surrounding us. We are caught. We are done. That's it. We are dead today. And then Elisha, man of God, just coolly walks out and says, all right. He prays for them. Listen in. You know, the ones who are with us are way greater than the ones who are standing around us. And he tells and he says, Lord, open his spiritual eyes that he may see. And the servant's eyes, spiritual eyes are open. And when he opens, he sees horses and chariots of fire surrounding Elisha right there protecting him. Amazing protection. Amen. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen. That is how you can resolve the conflict. Yes, he can be the prince of the world. He can be the ruler of the earth. He can be the god of this age. It doesn't matter because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. You've got an amazing protection. You've got amazing protection. And number two, Amen. amazing presence, as I told you. Amazing presence. The one who is in you, who is, he is greater than the one who is in the world. And Paul writes into the Romans, he says, and if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. Let's just ponder for a moment on that verse. The creator of the God of the universe. This is what sets our faith apart from every other faith around us. Because this God has made residence inside of us. While all other faiths, they are looking for a God that is outside. They are trying to seek him. They are trying to go after him. But here he says, when you encounter me, when you receive what Jesus has done on the cross, I will come inside of you and dwell with you. That is a significant difference of doctrine. We as Christians, we do not even understand that. We, I mean, have you ever taken time to think that this spirit of He dwells inside of you? He is inside. And when the creator of the universe is inside of you, why do we have to be afraid? Amazing protection. The amazing presence of God is inside of you and inside of me. That is why you and I need not fear. God still reigns. 
Satan's mechanism. I already read the scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 through 4. I read the scripture where I said that the God of this age, that the God of this age has blinded the eyes of people that they may not see the glory of the gospel of Christ. Spiritual blindness is a major mechanism that he uses. Spiritual blindness. There was this little boy in school. It was a Christian school. And then they were walking down the aisle. It was lunchtime. And as he entered, he saw at the first counter a pile of apples. And said, take one. God is watching. <laughs> so this guy took one and he walked to the end of the other extreme. And there he saw a pile full of chocolate chip cookies. Immediately he took a small paper and he wrote, take as many as you want. God is watching the apples. And he put it out there. The devil is doing something. He's blinded our eyes. He's saying, oh, God is looking out for that. He's not watching you. Come on, you can do whatever you want. Spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness. The second mechanism that he uses, this is primary. This is his uh, staple, staple way of doing it, especially against Christians. This is a known strategy. This is a known mechanism. Distortion of the word. Distortion of the word. What do I mean by saying distortion of the word? We need to scale back. We need to go back to Genesis 3.1 and read that million dollar question. The million dollar question that first set everything in motion. This is what it is. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had created, had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? You must not eat from any tree in the garden. He distorted it. God did not say that you cannot eat from any tree in the garden. He just isolated just one tree and said, that is the only tree that you will not eat from. The rest of the trees, everything else is there for you to enjoy. And how you see he has distorted that one thing that God said, and he said, did God, and he Cast in a doubt. That's not, Did God really say? And after the doubt, he distorted the word and he said that you must not eat from any tree in the garden. And that's exactly what he is doing right from the ages. He's going on. He's just constantly distorting God's word. And every time he comes to you and says, did God really say that? No, actually he did not. You don't have to do it. Look at all the people out there in the world. I mean, they're all doing what they want to do. Nothing is happening to them. They're doing it. Nothing is happening, no harm. So you can also do it. He distorts the word. You know, one of the main accusations that you and I as Christians will have to face as people who are followers of Christ, is that we always compromise. Most of the time, we compromise on God's word. When God says, this is something that is harmful for you, you are not supposed to do it, we try to compromise and say, can we do just this, this part of it? We won't do the whole big part, we won't do that. We'll just do this part alone. It's like Jesus and Satan were having a war. They were in a battle. They're, they both came down to this playground. And then there are many, many people out there. And Jesus and Satan started picking people. They said, okay, come on. And then there was a fence right in between. Jesus called people to his side by name. Satan called people to his side by name. And people were being separated. And at the end of the day, they both walked off to their own places. But there's one man who got up on the fence and he sat down there. He never went with Jesus. 
He never went with Satan. He did not want to offend both of them. You know, I saw this speaker there. I am offended because you are, you are so easily offended. But this man, he did not want to offend both Jesus and Satan, so he sat on the fence. And they both went away. But after some time, the Satan, he thought he lost something, so he came back. And he said, oh, there you are. I need you. Come to me. He said, no, I'm not coming to you. See, I didn't offend Jesus, neither am I offending you. I'm sitting on the fence. I don't belong to either of you. He said, you do belong to me because I own the fence. How many of us are sitting on the fence? How many of us are still sitting on the fence? Not having made that decision to do and to obey God's word without any questions, without any conditions to follow after him. Distortion of the word. And you see how this plays out in Matthew chapter 4 in the temptation of Jesus. You see how many times, you know, when that encounter goes on between Jesus and Satan, he first says, make these stones into bread, lust of the flesh. And he says, oh man shall not, Jesus has to counter him by saying, it is written in Deuteronomy. He starts quoting from Deuteronomy. So that means Jesus knew the word of God. He knew Deuteronomy. So from there he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then the second one comes in, second temptation, which is the pride of life. Jesus, you can become a celebrity, instant. Just throw yourself down. And see how smart Satan is. He quotes scripture from Psalm 90. He picks out. So he knows the word. And that is why he's able to distort the word. And the problem why we fall into this trap is we do not know the word. We do not know the word and that is why we fall into the trap. Because Satan is telling Jesus... Who is the very word of God? He said, oh, it says in the scripture, if you throw yourself down, there will be angels who will take care of you. You know, you and I have to learn this tactic from Jesus. We have to tell, it is also written. It is also written. That is the counter. Because the enemy knows the word. Unless you know the word more than the enemy, you will tell him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then he pulls back. This time he doesn't go there because he knows Jesus will say it is also written. So he just says, oh, look at all the kingdoms of the world. I can give it to you. Just worship me. One moment. You know what he was trying to do? He was saying, I mean, you don't have to go to the cross. Just do this. Just do this. And after that, the scripture says that for an opportune time, he left him and he came back again later. So we have the spiritual blindness. We have the distortion of the word. Now, what is Satan's work area? What is Satan's work area? Where does he work? How does he work? This is where he works. Number one, he works in our mind. That is his play field. He plays tricks with our mind. And that is why it is so important to know what you got to do with our mind. And Jesus makes it so very clear. And Paul writes to us in Colossians. He says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above and not on things of the earth. Not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. The mind is very, very critical. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Paul writes this. But I'm afraid, he's writing to them, he's saying, that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, 
your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. See what Paul writing is connecting what happened way back and he's saying, as ye was deceived, your minds may be led astray from your pure and sincere devotion to Christ. It's all there in the mind. That is his play field. That is his work area. He works in the mind. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 through 21, again Paul writes this. Philippians chapter 3. Eighteen through twenty-one, he writes this: For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction; their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his most glorious body. So what is Paul trying to tell us here? He's saying the worldly way of thinking is going to be focused more on your stomach. They live as the enemies of the cross of Christ. No wonder the restaurant business is one of the best businesses in our industry, in the industry. It will never go out of business. Mind you, you try it out. You can tell. The restaurant business will never go out as long as you make tasty food. People will stand in line for even an hour to get in if they know the food is good. They'll even travel for an hour to go and eat at the best restaurant. Paul is writing, your mind is not supposed to be on earthly things. Set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. There has to be a mind shift. You got to think about eternity because what's going to happen? This body that you're feeding, whatever you feed, however you feed, when it is done and dusted, it's going to be done and dusted out there. You can't do anything about it. But what the Bible says, our lowly body, he calls this body to be lowly body, will be transformed into a glorious body like Jesus' body. And that is the eternal life. You and I are called to be thinking about that life. The mind is his work area. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, this is a wonderful passage. I like this. You know, one of our greatest representatives in the Bible is our disciple Peter. He's a very, he represents Christians so much because he's like, oh Lord, I want to follow you. I want to do this for you. Oh, I want to deliver. I can do this. So Jesus has just again predicted his death to his disciples. And then he's talking about it. And then as he just said that, Peter is so shocked. And he said, no, this cannot happen to you, Jesus. Who will come and kill you? Nobody can come and get you. This should not happen to you. And immediately, you know what Jesus' response is? Get thee behind me, Satan. Just moments ago, Peter had made the greatest confession and said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied to him, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father is heaven, Father in heaven. You had a supernatural revelation, Peter. A human being did not tell you. There was a supernatural revelation to you. What happened? The supernatural Christian, the next moment, became a devil in the sight of Jesus. And Jesus said, get thee behind me. It proves the point that you and I can become a devil in a second. 
The moment, and Jesus said, I wanted to connect all of these pieces. He said, he told Peter after that, your mind is set on earthly things, on human things. You are not thinking about things that are heavenly. My death on the cross is a heavenly thing. Something is going to happen for the entire humanity. But you are thinking about, oh, Jesus, you're going to die. Earthly death. See, when our mind is on earthly things, you and I are being influenced by the devil. Our mind shift has to take place. Our mind shift has to take place. Number two, the, another, the second work area is in conjunction with that, is relationships. Relationships. Why do I say relationships? This is the reason I say relationships. James chapter 4, verses 4 through 10. I'm going to turn to that and read from there because this is pivotal as James writes to us. He was the brother of Jesus and he is writing in James chapter 4. This is what he says. Verse 4. You adulterous people. James minces no words. You adulterous people don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred before God, toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Strong words, James. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Because... The spirit who, lived in, who lives inside of us, he caused to live in us, envies intensely. You know what? It's like a relationship where a husband and a wife, they share intimacy at its best. And when something that should not happen, happens, there is that spirit that envies intensely. It's furious. It's raging. Because that person has been violated. Because that person belongs to only this partner. You know that anger that comes in at that time? It's like, so when you are in a relationship with Jesus, Jesus envies inside of you that you belong only to him. He doesn't want you to be a friend of the world. And that is why he says this. And then he goes on to say, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Friendship with the world. And then there's another scripture text. Uh, because of time I will not go in detail. It's called the Christ hymn. That was kind of the hymn that was being sung during the early church. It's found in Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11. Where it talks about your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And just before starting that, it talks about in your relationships with one another. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself and he came down. That is called the hymn, Philippians chapter 3. It says, you got to have the mindset of Jesus who came down and who was willing to lay down his life for his friends. That is the attitude in relationship. And I mentioned this last Sunday, and this Sunday, once again, in passing, I'm going to say that. We see so many issues in this world. It is all because of broken relationships. It starts in the family. It's percolated into the church. I told you, even in the church, we have so many church split. It's sad because it is that area he works. He wants to break relationships. 
because she knows that once she's got you there, once there is a relationship problem, what happens? Your mind is affected. See how mind and relationships are affected? How your mind is affected because your relationship is affected? How many times when you see somebody at the road, or I mean in a department store or somewhere, who are very obnoxious and who are very flippant towards you, and then one of the reasons that you usually give, we don't know, probably he had a hard time at home. We don't know what he faced at home. We don't know what he faced while on the way uh, driving up. Road rage. How about road rage? How rage anger comes in. Recently, I do not know whether you uh, read that story. It's not a story, actually. It was a real-life incident. Two people were jostling for a position in the, on the highway. They're traveling together, and they're trying to fight. And this guy, he was apprehended later. What he did, he became so angry, he pulled out a gun and shot that girl who was actually going into college. Shot her down. Road rage, anger in relationships. We, we say we may we may say we do not have relationships outside, but whenever whenever we are outside in, we have different kinds of relationships. Now moving on to the next part, the last one, and then our response. Satan's tools. What are Satan's tools? I told you about Satan's mechanism, his work area, and now his tools. What are Satan's tools? What does he use? What does he use? What are his tools? Number one, the media and the arts. That's his number one tool. If you're not being programmed by the word of God, you are being programmed by the media. By what you watch. By what you see. You're being programmed automatically. It just happens. Your mind is being programmed. And that is why you just want to do what the other people are doing. It's like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates are having a conversation with each other. And he said, you know what, uh, Bill? You know, I definitely have a place in heaven. You know why? Because I put so much love into the hearts of people. They love the iPhone. They love the iPhone. They can't wait for the next edition. Every time this one comes, they're waiting for the next edition. So through that, I worked out so much of love in their hearts. So I have a place in heaven. And then Bill says, no, no I do have a place in heaven. So how do you say that? He says, yeah, there are gates. You know, there's a gate that Jesus said, I am the gate to heaven. And Steve immediately said, but Bill, there are no windows in heaven. <laughs> the media and the arts capture our mind. Captures our mind. There's so much I can talk about media and the arts. How it is influencing our current culture. Not only our younger people. Even the older people, middle age, everybody in between. That's why I said, when I'm retired, I don't have to worry. I have Facebook waiting for me. <laughs> I live on Facebook. I can live. You know why I want to bring this issue out? It's very, very important. We need to read this. We need to know this. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, 14 through 16, John writes, Do not love the world or anything in the world. For if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So that means if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So what he is doing is making a connection saying, if you really are satisfied with the love of the Father, you will not love the world so much. The problem, we love the world and we love the things of the world is because the love of the Father is not in us. And that's what John writes. For all the things in the world, the lust of the flesh, yep. the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. The world in its present form is passing away. It's passing away. 
passing away. I want you to draw your attention to this particular article that was sent to me by my brother here in our church today. It's very, very important that we uh, pay attention to these things. Because we sometimes think that these things are not, you know, they are harmless. Facebook is harmless. I mean, you can just have a relationship. But you know there are murders on Facebook? You know murder take place on YouTube? They just play. They just play on those things and people get shot. And they try to connect with each other. Um, I mean, forget about Tinder and whatnot. They try to connect each other for relationships. I don't know how that works. If you become a friend on Facebook, it's like the guy who claimed to have like 5,000 friends on Facebook. And this, uh, another friend, he made the comments. When he went to his funeral, he saw like five or six people. And he said, I thought this fellow said he had 5,000 friends. There are only five people here in his, on his funeral day. What happened? This is what Mark Zuckerberg, I said this before, like probably a year or two ago, I said that. I said Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, he took that one idea, because you and I are created for relationships. God put that inside of us. He took that concept, that idea, and he's making billions of dollars. He took that idea and he's making billions of dollars, trying to create relationships, which we know is fake. Virtual relationships do not exist. I mean, they do exist, but you know its effectiveness. And this is what he said just last month, June 29th. Mark Zuckerberg has claimed Facebook is the new church. And the social network can take on the role that religion once did in giving people a sense of community. The billionaire boss said groups on Facebook could give people a sense they are part of something bigger than ourselves, akin to a religious congregation. The reason, the significance of uh, him saying this is, Facebook has just passed 2 billion users this week. And now he's saying that uh, people could find purpose and support online, and that he wants to see, now that they just passed 2 billion, he wants to see, he sees that only 100 million Facebook users are part of what he called a meaningful community. Out of 2 billion, only 100 million are having a meaningful community. So now what he's saying is, the goal for this organization is that he wants that 100 million figure to rise to 1 billion. And he said, if we can do this, it will not only turn around the whole decline in community membership we've seen for decades, it will start to strengthen our social fabric and bring the world closer together. As I've traveled around and learned about different places, one theme is clear. Every great community has leaders. Think about it. A church doesn't just come together. It has a pastor, like me, and Pastor Greg, who cares for the well-being of their congregation, and that is why I say the things that I say, makes sure they have food and shelter. Leaders set the culture, inspire us, give us a safety net, and look out for us. See how he's making the comparison? Church is going to take the place of Facebook. Media arts is competing for the minds and hearts of people. People, we need to make a shift today. We need to make a mental shift to the word of God. We can't compromise on our time, the time that we spend on media and the things that are legitimate. I am not saying they're illegitimate. Legitimate things. Paul gives us principles to that. Media and arts. And uh, I think there's a picture there. It looks like Mark Zuckerberg is blessing the people in the church. He's pronouncing a blessing right here. The second tool, very quickly, the second tool is money. Second tool is money. He uses money. The tool is money. There's an age-old proverb that I have heard that 
If you show or if you dangle a dollar bill in front of a dead body or a corpse, the corpse will open its mouth. <laughs> Even a corpse will open its mouth if you dangle a dollar bill. Money is a tool that the enemy uses. What does the scripture say? I do not have much time, but I'm going to say this. For the love of money is root of all evil. And it says, because of this many, remember, catch this, the latter part of the verse. Because of this, many have wandered from the faith that they were once in. Because of that love, you're wandering from the faith. Enemy uses that. He knows that you and I need it, but he uses that in order to drive us away. You know, it just comes to as simple as believing in God as a provider. He provides for us what we need. He may not give us all that we want, but he will give us what we need. But the problem is we want, we want, we want. We want stuff. And uh, this is what uh, one person said like this. Advertising. This was said in the 19th century, the 19, early 90s, uh, early 1900s. The gentle art of persuading the public to believe that they want something they don't need. What is advertising? The gentle art of persuading people to believe that they want something they don't need. Actually, we do not need computers to live. Because you know all our forefathers, some of the people who are like into your very senior most years, you didn't live on computers. You lived well. People lived well without computers. They lived longer. They, they ate healthy food. Why now we have all of these problems? Think about it. We don't need most of the things that we have. We don't need. You know, all that you need is a person to love and for to be loved by others and God. That is all you need. That is all you need. You need just people to love you. And if you have that, no matter what, you will be happy. You will be happy. So, money is that. And in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. That is a Christian principle. That is a Christian principle. We cannot be a servant we need to learn to live within our means. We got to simplify our lives. We've got to simplify our lives. God will give us what we need. We can live sufficiently and happily. And you can do what God wants you to do. You can fulfill God's purpose for your life. The problem is you want other things and you become so focused and then you have a problem there and you be spend so much of time there. Then you have to have two jobs. You have to work a night job in order to make ends meet. Gone are the days when only a man used to go to work. The woman never used to go to work. They are sufficient and happy living with what they had. They raised actually seven, eight, ten children. Here we can't even live uh, with one or two kids, right? Both people have to go. Because they had a lot of time at home, of course they can have a lot of children, right? So, there is a disconnect. You need to think about it. We got to simplify our lives. A Westerner is one, it is said, who buys things that he does not need with the money that he does not have to impress people that he doesn't like. <laughs> Easterners, you do the same, to impress people, those who you do not even see, because they are far away. We need to understand our position right here, how the enemy has distorted our minds and our thinking, and has got us running the rat race here, instead of focusing on kingdom purpose.
money. Quickly, number three and number four. Number three is food and sex. I already mentioned about food. I already mentioned about food, so I'm not going to talk much about it. Because uh, olden days, they never even had fast food. They had only like slow crock pot cooking and all that, and they lived long. Now we eat fast food, and we go faster. <laughs> Up our heavens, like. But sex, gift of God. How Satan has distorted that very thing, I do not have much time, but I'm just going to give you that thought. Sex was not, ladies and gentlemen, was not invented by the devil. It's not evil. It's a good thing, I know. I'm married. <laughs> but he has taken that very thing and he has distorted it. He is making millions and millions of dollars through pornography. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Because God has placed inside a man, the way that he has created is through the eyes. And that is why whenever we look at something, things happen inside, everything is triggered. So he knows how to trick us. So he has brought in this media. He just wants us to see stuff, look at stuff. The moment we see it, we want it. He works through our eyes. Through what we see. Through what we see. We've got to be very careful. And because of time, I won't spend much time, but just wanted to let you know that with regard to sex, with regard to sex, God, uh, I mean, Paul took it so seriously. And he said even to married couples, this is what he told married couples. He said, except for a time for prayer, do not deprive each other. For... He said, Satan will use that as a trap to come and tempt you. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. And in regarding food, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8, Paul tells it so beautifully. Food does nothing good to us, nothing bad to us. It's a harmless thing. We just have to use our discretion to eat good, healthy food. I think I'm bringing down the business of McDonald's today. <laughs> Hopefully. Healthy food. Very important. Food God created. He gave it to us to enjoy. And he took that. He distorted it again. You see the distortion? I hope your minds are working and you're seeing the distortion in every area. And some of the areas that I'm not mentioning, I hope God is bringing to your mind. And uh, lastly, the last tool is government. Government. Government is instituted by God. All authorities, all authorities are God established. And we are expected to obey the government. But you know, the government has certain laws in place. Sometimes they change the laws. We are supposed to obey the laws of the government. But government is a tool which the enemy uses to distort our minds and our thinking. Because once the laws are changed, we think it is right. No, it's not right. The government, we know who's the prince of this world. You know how he uses the government in order to change the laws. So you need to know what is in this law, in this God's law, so that you'll be able to counter that law and say, no, as much as you say that, no, my word, the word of God does not say that. And in um, Acts chapter 5, verses 28 through 29, Peter and John are being questioned because they did a miracle and they were teaching and they took them into jail and then they released them and said, we order you strictly. You are not supposed to teach on this name of Jesus. You are not supposed to teach anybody. But you know, they were found teaching the very next day in the synagogue. They were teaching. And they came and got, a, again the Romans came and said, how are you teaching? We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. And you know what was their answer? We would rather, we are, we are called to rather obey God rather than men. We are supposed to obey God rather than men. And that is what you and I are supposed to do. Government 
is being ruled by men. As long as their laws are in line with what you and I are called to believe and do, you can obey. But when there is a discord or a disconnect, you can use the same answers as Peter and John said and say, we are called to obey God rather than men. So what is our response finally? As simple as this. Live by the word to overcome the world. Live by the word to overcome the world. Why do I say that? How can you live by the word? This is where the problem is. How can you live by the word? In 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, this is what John is writing. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. He's talking about salvation. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. He's writing to young men and he's saying you've overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. Again, he writes to the young men and he says, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. The word of God needs to live in you in order to overcome the evil one. Live by the word of God in order to overcome the world. Live by the word of God in order to overcome the world, the system of thought. thought. That is what you have to do. And it says the word of God lives in you very strongly. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 through 2. It says... Do not conform to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that you will know what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect will. Look at that slide I have. Ever changing transformation. Transformation by the word of God is possible. This, I took it in Franklin Institute. And this is what it says. The change is physical. The brain... I've got to read it from here. Your brain develops with you. It changes each time you learn a new fact, visit an unfamiliar place or master a skill. The change is physical. The brain must develop a new neural pathway to correspond with the newly added knowledge. The circuitry is rearranged. In other words, your brain is always under construction. Franklin Institute right here in Pennsylvania. Your brain is adapted or created in such a way that it changes, it can change. It creates a new neural pathway every time you know a new fact and you do it. Only when you live by the word, that's when you learn a new fact, you do it, what happens? Your brain learns, okay, this is new. So it adapts to that change. Your mind and my mind can be transformed by the power of God's word. The last verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Just to give you a picture of how we can resolve us being in the world and still living not of the world, but being overcome, overcoming the evil one, living by the word. How can you do it? Paul gives it to us in a superb phrase. He said, you and I are ambassadors of Christ. You know the ambassador of ambassadors in that nations that they represent? When they go to the United Nations and when they sit there, the ambassador that represents the nation will follow the instructions of the nation that they are representing. For example, the American ambassador, when she visits the United Nations, she is supposed to carry out 
what United States stands for on all the issues surrounding the world, the controversial issues. She cannot come up with anything on her own. It's similar to that. You and I are ambassadors of Christ. We live to a different standard, the standard that God has given us in his word. But we live in this world because we are sent into this world to create an impact. Are you willing to be an ambassador today? To be transformed in your mind to know God's will for your life. And if it is so, I want you to stand. Next week, I will focus on the sinful nature, how that works in tandem with the devil the world system of thought and creates a warfare scenario for us but today may I ask you humbly implore you on Christ's behalf as Paul did be an ambassador for Christ be reconciled to God What are the areas that the Lord brought to your mind today, the Spirit of God brought to your mind today to reconcile with Him? And say, Father, I defer to your word as much as I was thinking about all of the things that I wanted to. If your word says so, I will do it. I want to live by the word so that I can overcome the world. The scripture says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their life so much as to shrink back from death. They did not love their lives so much, but they overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb, which is Jesus, and by the word of their testimony to say Jesus' blood has cleansed us and we now live according to the standards that he has set for us for we have been called and been given the gift of eternal life. If there's anyone here today who does not know what it is to experience his eternal life, I would like you to contact us after service. Stay in touch with us. If you want to know more, reach out to us. And we are here to help you. Our contact numbers are available for you. You need to settle the transaction once for all. You cannot be on the fence. If you are a child of God, bought by the blood of Jesus, and you are going to acknowledge and say, Father, I have strayed away. I have compromised with many things. Today I'm coming back. I'm reconciling myself to you. Here I am, Lord. Would you just open up your hands and surrender to him? God will speak to you. I have no doubts about it. God will speak to you. You are indicating today that you have a heart of obedience and say, Father, after hearing these two messages and even today especially I want to surrender myself unreservedly to obeying your word to spending time 
reading your word, so that I will know your word, so when the enemy comes against me, I will be able to tell him, it is also written. Father, I pray that you'll equip your children with supernatural power, that their mind will not be set on earthly things, but on heavenly things. Help them to make the changes in the area where they have to make. Father, though they may find it difficult, you can tell them, Lord, you can assure them of your presence to say, you have heard from me. When you obey me, my blessings will follow you. You can create an impact in my kingdom for the sake of my name. Father, would you help? I thank you because you have assured us of your help. Holy Spirit, just come and fill us, Lord. Every heart that has been touched today, I pray that you will get a grip on them. That you would engineer the change that their lives will never be the same again. Open up their minds, Lord, every day when they open up their word. Like how you opened up the spiritual eyes of Elisha's servant. Would you open up their spiritual eyes to see things that they've never seen before? And know the calling that you have placed upon their lives. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and grant you grace both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Be blessed.